Sometimes I think Americans feel that our country is so unusual, that's so truly unique, that we've actually transcended the cycles of history that there's no point in looking back in history for warnings or examples of what might happen to us because we're so different from any country or empire that's ever existed. But this isn't true. Uh, actually, uh, the history, history shows that all great nations and empires have had ups and downs. Countries that have survived over many, many centuries, like say Iran or China, are used to this. They understand that when things aren't going well, even if that goes on for a century or two, the cycles of history will bring them up again. They can look back over 20, 40 centuries. Then you develop an understanding for this. But Americans are not used to this. Uh, the arc of American history is quite misleading. It tells us that we always get richer and stronger and more powerful and more beloved. But that's never happened with any country in history. And I think right now we're at the moment where we're starting to realize that that won't be our fate forever. I'm not sure we're psychologically prepared for this for the fact that the U.S. is not going to be able to dictate the way the world runs indefinitely. Uh, it's important for us to recognize that cycles of history also affect us and not to be thrown into a panic when we realize that other forces in the world are emerging and that at least our relative power is inevitably going to decline over time. The beloved part uh, strikes me as, oh boy, <laughs> we are not beloved. <laughs> at least in many places we are not beloved. Um, you add something else of enormous interest. It says, uh, the Dulles brothers added two other convictions, both bred into them over many years. One was missionary Christianity, which tells believers that they understand eternal truths and have an obligation to convert the unenlightened. Alongside it was the presumption that protecting the right of large American corporations to operate freely in the world is good for everyone. I mean, that, those are so contradictory that it, you just have to laugh at. Anyhow, why don't you elaborate them? One of the reasons I find the story of the Dulles brothers so fascinating is that they really reflect America. The forces that shaped John Foster Dulles and Alan Dulles are the forces that shaped this country. And when we understand them, I think we understand our country better and we understand better why we behave the way we do in the world. So what were those forces? I think there were three important ones. First of all, they grew up in this very elite environment. Their grandfather had been Secretary of State. Their uncle was Secretary of State. Before they'd even reached their teens, they were sitting around at dinner parties in Washington with Grover Cleveland and Woodrow Wilson and Bernard Baruch and William Howard Taft and ambassadors and senators. Uh, through these experiences, they assimilated this idea of American exceptionalism. Uh, their grandfather had been a pioneer and risen through uh, the ranks of power he perceived of America's uniqueness as the explanation for why we deserved to cover all of North America. And they took that belief and extended it to the whole world. So this belief in the exceptional nature of the United States, that we had a, a providential mission on Earth that allowed us to behave in ways that we wouldn't want others to behave, was one important factor that shaped them. And that also shapes our country. Second one is, as you mentioned, uh, missionary Calvinism. Calvinism treats teaches you that there's one true faith and all the other religions are wrong. And if you believe that about religion, it's actually a short step to believing the same thing about politics, that there's one political system that's good and all the others are bad. And then the missionary aspect teaches you that you can't just sit home and hope that those bad countries become good. You have to go out there and, and, and change them. And the third factor that shaped them definitely was their decades of work representing the largest American multinational corporations at this law firm in uh, New York, Sullivan and Cromwell. They came to view their job as protecting the right of American corporations uh, to invest and be active and extract resources in, from and have markets in foreign countries. And they measured how free a country was by how much freedom it gave to American companies to operate there. So those three factors, the belief in American exceptionalism, the missionary Calvinist ideal and the service of, Amer in, of American corporations shaped them and I think shaped us and our foreign policy. Religiosity was an everyday matter in their homes. These people came there and ate dinner and so they, they were exposed to this all the time. And Al, I think it was Ali who once, when he was a very little boy, eight or nine, he'd go upstairs and he, he'd write down what people had said, which 
for a kid that age, this is not normal. <laughs> it's quite a remarkable story. He'd be at these dinner parties given by his grandfather for all these eminent figures, and then the boys couldn't participate in the dinner because they were just little kids, but they listened, and then they would go up and go to bed, except Alan, future CIA director, did not go to bed. He'd write what were essentially intelligence reports to himself. Of who was there, what did they say, and what did they really mean behind what they said? Here's a kid who's like nine years old writing this. Uh, you begin to wonder what goes on inside a mind like that. This excerpt is brought to you by the Massachusetts School of Law, a leader of reform in legal education and a leader in multimedia education for the public. To view the full interview and for a full listing of MSL's programs, log on to mslaw.edu.